Okay, we started this morning with um, the church and truth and sort of established some things and gave you some, I trust you'll view it as insight into what's going on and what God wants and how there's got to be a change. And the, the change doesn't come by uh, just going out and aggressively attacking people or telling this group they're wrong and that group they're wrong. That's, that's not the approach. The approach is when we have a platform, when we have an opportunity, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's to a group, whatever, that we speak the truth in love here again uh, is the, the door of opportunity opening and us taking advantage of the opportunity that's been given to us. You, you understand that? Because a lot of people say, well, we just need to change the world. The church has to do something. The church needs to go do this and go do that. And I've been thinking this afternoon, it, it's interesting um, just the way people think, and I'm talking about just religious people, especially conservative people who would like um, for the government to make right decisions and Congress to do the right things and support the, uh, uh, appoint the right judges and all this type stuff. But now here's where you are. It's not your decision. They're not going to ask you to vote on it. You with me? The people that have been voted into office are going to make decisions. Now, if we voted the wrong people in the office, shame on us. But it is what it is once it's there. Okay? And so our role is to intercede for the nation. Our role is to pray. Our role is not to sit around and talk politics. And talk about what could be, should be, and all that. Because all it's going to do is make you mad. You understand? You, you sit there and you, you watch these hearings. You watch the TV. You watch this. You watch that. All it does is stirs up an anger on the inside of you. And it's not righteous indignation. It's just getting mad. Nothing good comes out of that. So what do we do? Bloom where we're planted. We do all we know to do. We do what God gives us the opportunity to do. We stand our ground. And, and this is not, it's not all talk. It's, it's lifestyle. It's how we live our lives in front of people. There's a consistency. Our behavior needs to match our conversation. And this is where the church has failed. It's been um, superficial. It's, it's talk stuff, but when you pull the curtains back... What you're seeing is just the world. And I'm telling you, in the modern day church, you're just seeing the world in the church. They're just, you know, a religious group. And talking about things that they're not living. But we're not going to be like that, are we? Now, what I'd like to do this evening is, I, I mentioned as, at the closing this morning, there is a way that seems right to a man. But the end of that way is death. And so it is with a church that's abandoned the truth. You have a religious form that will lead people to death. And I'm talking about a spiritual death. That's even worse. In Matthew chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14, if you want to turn there, we'll... We'll look at that, and then um, I just want to share some things that, that I, I really believe the Lord uh, revealed to me concerning uh, this passage of Scripture. And it sort of excited me to finally learn what it meant after all these years. <laughs> but in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus doing this speaking, uh, verse 13, He says, Enter in at the straight or the narrow gate 
because broad or wide is the gate and spacious or wide is the way that leads to destruction. And many are going in thereby. The spacious way, the wide way, the broad way. And then verse 14, he says, because narrow or straight, as it says here, which means narrow. Narrow is the gate. And narrow, actually constricted, is the way which leads unto life. Now look at this. And few find it. Obviously, this is, if you look at this from a percentage perspective. So, there are two ways. One is wide and spacious. The other is narrow and constraining or confining. All right? The wide and spacious way relates to religion. I believe that's what the Spirit said to me. The wide and the spacious way is religion. Many are going that way. I mean, you know, on any given Sunday in this city, thousands, if you put all the churches together, you know, will be in attendance. But how many of them are following the straight and narrow? How many are following the way of Jesus? Okay? The narrow and constraining way is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. There is no other way. That makes it very confining, doesn't it? If you're going to get to the Father, then it will be through Jesus. It's not a wide path. It's not a broad, spacious way. And religion today is saying God understands. Yeah, God understands. God understands if you're a sinner, and God understands if you're living by faith. God understands if you're following Jesus. That's what God understands. God understands if you have a rebellious, stubborn heart. Now let's talk about what God understands. Okay? It's not that, well, it's going to be okay. You know, a loving God doesn't do this and doesn't do that, and a loving God won't send anybody to hell. You're absolutely right. He won't, but he'll sure let you go if that's what you choose. You choose whether you go the wide way, spacious way, or the narrow way through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way to the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Religion leads to destruction. All you have to do is follow history. Open your Bible Follow the history. Follow the history of the nation of Israel. And you'll find that religion led them away from God. It didn't lead them to God. And religion, by the time Jesus came on the scene, in, in Matthew, what you're seeing is religion is just a, a, an ecclesiastical political system that is controlling people and telling them, if you do what we say, everything will be all right. But that system rejected Jesus. So are you going to do what the system says that rejects Jesus and you're going to be all right? No. That's why the people had to come out of the system. See, religious, religion's spacious. Jesus isn't. Very confining. I know religion places some restrictions on the flesh. Some. But it indulges the flesh in many other areas. As a matter of fact, if you look at just the average church, and I don't care what the denomination is, if you just look at the average church, you're going to find that mainly what they're doing is flesh-related, not spirit-related. Now I'll let you think about it. The activities... Flesh related, not spirit related. Even the things that go on in a service are flesh related rather than spirit related. It's to 
appeal to emotion in a lot of cases or to appeal to intellect in other cases, depending on which type church you're in. And both are things of the flesh. I know there's true emotions ordained by God, but that will be stimulated by the Spirit. And there's a difference. Okay? So, the broad, spacious way follows the flesh. It does what the flesh wants to do. That's why you have these different uh, churches today, these seeker-friendly churches, and these what they call in emerging churches or conversation churches or coexisting churches. And, and, and the interesting thing is some of the most influential leaders are promoting this stuff. Well, you have to accept everybody. Jesus doesn't. And they don't either. See, they, uh, they violate their own doctrine. They'll accept Islam, but they won't accept people who are led by the Spirit of God speaking the truth of God. You with me? They'll coexist in things of the flesh, but they won't in things of the Spirit. Because God and Satan don't coexist. You understand? God and carnality don't coexist. Spirituality is totally different than carnality. So how they don't agree, so how can they live together? As a matter of fact, the 8th chapter of Romans says that carnality is hostile toward God. Now it's interesting that it says it that way. It doesn't say that the spirit is hostile to the flesh. But the flesh is hostile to the spirit. Those who are walking in the spirit don't go out here and attack the, the, the natural. But the natural will attack those who are being led by the spirit. Have you ever noticed that? That's why we made the statements that we did at the beginning. God is not calling us to just bear arms and go overthrow the government. In case you haven't figured this out yet, you're not a citizen of this kingdom. You're a citizen of the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is to be ruling our hearts. We're to come under the constitution of God. We're to be thinking about God, not out here fighting people to no avail, I might add, that don't agree with the constitution of the nation. Now, I'm saying this, and I would be pegged as a constitutionalist. You understand? I would be pegged as a patriot. But I can tell you this, my allegiance is to the Lord Jesus Christ. God has not called me to fight natural. We pray daily for the United States of America. You understand? And I believe that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not natural, not fleshly. But they are mighty through God to where we can pull down strongholds. We can do it in the spirit realm. Have you ever read Daniel? Where when Daniel prayed and then 21 days later, Gabriel shows up and he said, God dispatched me the first day. But... My paraphrase, I've been detained over here, fighting against the prince of Persia and Greeks. He said, and, and Michael, your, uh, your archangel is the only one to help me. And when I leave you, I'm going to go back. And when I do, that Persian empire is coming down and the Grecian empire is coming up. Done in the spirit realm. If you want to see things change naturally, then do it spiritually. You understand? Take care of it in the spirit realm. And you'll see things change in the natural realm. That's how people get saved that, are, that have no, do not have their mind on God, have no idea of getting saved, but somebody's interceding and somebody's praying and somebody's before God. Somebody's doing spiritual warfare as we would call it. And then it manifests in the flesh. Thank God somebody prayed for me. So why shouldn't I pray for other people? It should. 
So this is a narrow way. It's through Jesus. That means we have to do things Jesus' way. Everything that the church is, should be doing today should agree with the ministry and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we put great emphasis on the study of Jesus and on starting with the life of Jesus. How can you represent someone you don't know? Learn his life and then let him be your role model, if you will. Pattern your life after Jesus. And then minister in the manner that Jesus ministered. And how was that? He did what he heard his father say. Or what he saw his father do. And really we complicate ministry and try to make things happen rather than hearing and obeying. And that's what God's calling us to do, hear and obey. God hasn't called me to manipulate a service to where the service goes in a certain direction. What God wants me to do is hear what He says and deliver what He says, however that may be. And then the will of God is accomplished. You understand? But we want to stereotype services. Listen, I love it when the gifts of the Spirit are operating. You understand? I don't think anyone appreciates it any more than I do. But that doesn't happen in every service, especially when you have the same people week after week after week. How many words of knowledge are you going to give them? How much are you going to prophesy to them? You understand? And there's a place for all of it. But we can't be picking and choosing. We eat from the table that God sets. And make sure that God sets the table. If that makes sense to you. Okay? Doing things Jesus' way. Following the Spirit. And we have to make a choice. We can coexist, we can be politically correct, we can be acceptable to the world or to the ecclesiastical system, or we can die to the world. We can walk in truth, being led by the Spirit of God, and be acceptable to Jesus. So which way will you choose? I was listening to a song a couple weeks ago, sort of a catchy little tune to it. Which way will you choose is the name of the song. One of them's going to lead you to destruction. One of them will lead you to life everlasting. You choose it by the decisions you make on a daily basis. You understand it? One of the lines in that song says, you have everything to gain, you have everything to lose by your decision. God wants us making the right decision, the, the right decision, not by looking at the broad, spacious way. Well, everybody's doing it. How many times have you heard that? Well, everybody's doing it. I mean, that's the popular thing. And this, this notion, is a, it goes with fads. Have, have you ever noticed that? Even in, in, in style of clothes, style of hair, and uh, all this type stuff. And, and, you know, it's a fad now to have blue hair, purple hair, orange hair, whatever, you know. What well, do you want to go with that fad? Do you want to look like everybody else or would you dare to be different? And God has chosen a people who will dare to be different in all aspects of their life. I'm going to tell you right now, if you get your heart right with God, the outside will display what's on the inside. And I can, I can look at people and I can say, I, I, I can just walk by and I'm not their judge, but I'm not stupid. I can say, well, that person has a heart problem. Not right with God. Because if they were, they would be embarrassed by how they present. 
And we're in a world today to where there's not just a whole lot of shame anymore. Isn't that amazing? A broad way. But the church say, says, accept it. The modern day church. Not the body of Christ. The body of Christ says accept Jesus and accept Jesus' way. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Love the sinner enough to pray for the sinner, but never condone the sin of the sinner. And never be shy in taking a stand against these obvious, obnoxious sins. Where there's no question as to whether or not you accept or reject that lifestyle. You love the person, but you hate the sin. And so you love the person enough to pray for them. Not, you can't jerk the slack out of them. You can't beat it into them. You can't beat the devil out of them. <laughs> you understand? You love them. And you give them something they would want. All religious systems, whether they're traditional, contemporary, uh, friendly seekers and all this type stuff, or emerging systems, they're going to lead one to his own demise. You may go in and enjoy your donuts and coffee. But what's your spirit being fed? I mean, you know, they may give you a good covered dish, but are they feeding your spirit? And I, I'll tell you a trend that I'm seeing, and, and um, if I thought about it, it, it would really bother me. But I have observed this in church, how people come into church with their snacks. Or in some cases with their McDonald's sack. And I, I'm, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced it. This is not hearsay. And you're going to sit there and feed the flesh and expect the spirit to grow. That's not going to happen. You're going to have to choose whether you're going to go for the flesh or for the spirit. And when you have the opportunity to get in the presence of God, forget the flesh, flee, feed the spirit. There will be a time that you can feed your body. But I can tell you right now, the house of God is not the place to feed it. And I know people would come back and say, well, I am the house of God. Really? We'll clean it up. Make it look like a house of God. Would God do to his house what you're doing to it? And see, so this, is, this is what the Lord is really dealing with me about is the church. He's depending upon the church to get the truth out to the world. And the church is living a lie. It's in a deception. It thinks it's righteous and holy, but it's not following the principles of God. It's not following the Word of God. It's not being led by the Spirit. It's going down a broad way, and anyone that follows that way is going to be destroyed. So if a person followed you, where would they go? Would they get closer to God? If they followed your lifestyle... Just watching you on a daily basis and followed your lifestyle, would they get closer to Jesus Christ? That's what the church of Jesus Christ is going to have to evaluate. We are leaders. I don't care what your position is. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you're leading to, in some capacity. Where are you leading them? God wants us to lead people to Him. And any other way than Jesus is a deception. And when I say Jesus, I'm not talking about just message. I'm talking about lifestyle. Any other lifestyle beside the lifestyle that Jesus would live is a deception. Jesus was sold out to his Father. It's hard to get people committed and sold out to the Lord today. Do you notice that? Flesh gets in the way. 
well, I need to do this. You know, I haven't had any time off and I need some time off and all this. And, uh, you know, I think that time off will uh, hurt you. If you're pulling away from the Lord, I know it'll hurt you. Stay on track. Stay with the Lord. Well, I might get burnt out. Well, it burnout comes from getting away from the Lord, not from overworking. The burnout comes when you get away from the fuel. So if you're feeling burnout, fuel up. Tank up. Get closer to the Lord. God's dependent upon the church, the body of Christ, to proclaim the truth. And if the church doesn't proclaim the truth, there's no one else to proclaim it because the church is the holder of the truth. So the church must separate itself from the religious systems of the world. And when I say religious systems, I'm talking about much of what you see today. Um, both traditional and modern. And walk in truth. And so you, you, you get either or. The old traditional people say, well, we, we're in truth and they're all wrong. And we're, you know, we're, we're in the legalism. We're the fundamentalist and we're this and we're that. Well, is your, fundament, or your fundamentals what the Lord has ordained or what you have con, uh, conjectured? You with? And I'll be fair with you. Most religion has... has they, they have their own recipe for, for what truth is, and it's not God's. And we've got to get back to God. I'm not saying fundamentals, I'm saying to God. We must get back to the true foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ, and gauge everything by the foundation. Is it right with the foundation? Is it level? Is it plumb? Is it square to the foundation? If it's not, there's something wrong with it because the foundation is perfect. That foundation being the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church has to separate itself from all these religious systems to walk in truth. The one that's been called to proclaim truth must not abandon truth. And so that's what's happened. God is dependent on the church to get the truth out, and the modern day church has abandoned truth. That's why the world's in the situation it's in. It's not because of this person or that person in a political position. It's because of the church. That person wouldn't be there had the church stood its ground and declared the truth to the nation as God opened the doors of opportunity. And it's done one person at a time. And people are looking for some uh, uh, spectacular event to win the world. It's one person at a time. It's supernatural every day. It's not the spectacular. You overlook supernatural looking for spectacular. Looking for some big event and you've got something right there under your nose to where you can represent the Lord. Represent the Lord. What if all the professing Christians just represented the Lord? Do you think that would impact people's lives? Of course it would. And in a very positive way. God expects and requires the church to walk in truth. Remember what John wrote? I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. That's God inspiring him to say that. God has no greater joy than to hear that his people are walking in truth. What does that mean? That they're walking in the word, that they're being led by the spirit of God. Do you want to bring God joy? Walk according to the word, walk according to the spirit, and that brings joy to God. And that's our, that, really, that's our mandate you understand a true church is the body of Christ. It's not a system. It's not an organization, a religious organization. It's a living organism. It, it is a, a living body that's to be active in church. I mean, in, in the world. Are you with me? 
that we're to be out here as members of the body of Christ, each member doing its part in this world. That's how things get accomplished. Isn't it amazing that Paul's little team was accused of turning the world upside down? And if you want to check it out, his numbers weren't a lot. Paul wouldn't have been voted the most popular. He didn't have the big following. See, we have Paul up on a pedestal today, and believe me, he was a great apostle. But I can promise you in his day, he wasn't on the pedestal. A lot of it, he's in prison. A lot of it, he was suffering. Why? Because he had such a burning passion to get the truth out to the people that he was lay his life on the line to tell them the truth. Not trying to force it on them, but he had opportunities, doors open to him. When he'd go into the synagogue and they say, you know, do you have anything? He had something. Truth. Truth. You have something. You have truth. But let's get more truth. And more truth, and more truth to where we're walking in truth in all areas of our lives. I want to see believers rise up all over the world and, and proclaim and explain unadulterated truth. Don't mix it. The truth of the Word of God and don't apologize for it. You know, for many years I have been Declaring regularly, Jesus is Lord of Thomasville, North Carolina. And back some time ago, I was up here uh, and I was praying and then I made that declaration, Jesus is Lord of Thomasville, North Carolina. And the Spirit said to me, the way I Lord over Thomasville is through my body. If you want to see the Lordship of Jesus in Thomasville, then you have to go out and represent the Lord. I am depending on my body to exercise the authority of the kingdom of God. Not in overthrowing the government, but in influencing the government to make right decisions for God. How do we influence? By saying, if you don't, I'm not going to vote for you? No. By gaining their confidence. By being people of integrity. And they watch you. And they know if you're trustworthy. They know if you're honorable. They know if you pay your bills on time. They know if you keep your word. Those are the things that impact people in positions. They watch you. People are watching you all the time. Or they see in truth... Or are they hearing one thing and seeing something else? Do they see a consistency in our lives? People must see a, consist, a, a consistency in our lives. It's not that we're one thing on Sunday and another thing on Monday. But we're to be the same everywhere. To where we're being led by the Spirit. We're being dominated, if you will, by the Word of God. That just simply means the Word has dominion over us. To where we stay submitted to the Word. And when God speaks something to you that's uh, different than what other people are doing, you don't criticize other people for doing it. You just do what God's told you to do. You understand? You know, there, there was a time when... Uh, the Lord said to me, and I was I was uh, dressing very casual. Now the Lord said to me, "You're too casual." And then He said, "You're a diplomat, dress like it," and I mean very firm. And I knew exactly what He was saying: ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives of Christ. You know, an ambassador is a diplomat. And that ambassador is presenting wherever he goes, he's presenting the nation, not just himself. 
So he has to conduct himself and dress in a, in a way that he's not bringing a reproach against his government, against his nation, not misrepresenting. And what the Lord was saying to me personally was I wasn't a very good representation by his standard. And so I changed immediately, but he didn't tell me to tell anybody else to change. You with me? A lot of times when God speaks to us, we want to make a doctrine out of it and make everybody else do it. That's not what he told me to do. He dealt with me personally. Live it out. In the same way with TV. I was asking the Lord, I want to know you. I want to, get, I want to, I want to be closer to you. I want to know you more than I know you now. And here's what he said to me. You can't know me and watch TV. Watch, you subjecting yourself to TV, that's influencing your life. You want to know me more? Then spend time with me. Give that up for me. And so I did. But here again, he didn't tell me to tell everybody else not to watch TV. Although I will tell you that it's detrimental to you. You can take it or leave it. And we're not going to have a falling out over it. You understand? You tell me the God that's coming out of it. And I can tell you even through the ministry that comes forth, there's not a real high percentage of God coming out of that. Okay? And I'm going to tell you, we're going to have to evaluate our lives if we're going to live by the standard of God. And God has a very high standard, and it's narrow. You understand? It's very constraining. So you can't be like everybody else. You have to be different. That's what he wanted out of the nation of Israel. He wanted them to be different from any other nation. But they wanted the spacious way. The law was too confining. God's way was too confining for them. And in the modern day society now, we say Jesus' way is too confining. Says who? Not the true body of Christ. The true body of Christ wants to be attached to the head and go where the head goes. You with me? But this modern day church is walking around headless or trying to make themselves the head of the church. Consequently, truth left. So the world is not seeing truth. You with me? Truth has to be lived out. And I'll promise you Jesus Christ lived out truth. He said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And the body of Christ, and I understand how I say this, don't, don't get a big head and egotistical and all this, but the body of Christ should have that same mentality. We are the way because we're connected to Jesus. Consequently, we have the truth. We're the truth because we're connected to Jesus. We're life because we can lead people in the eternal life by accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the representative in the earth, the representation of truth. But are we living it? That's the question. And I can tell you that it is a very disciplined Lifestyle. Because flesh will scream. Pepper me, pepper me. Give me some attention. I need my time. And I deserve it. <laughs> what a lie. And all it's trying to do is take you away from the eternal life that God has you destined for. It's just trying to pull you away. That God had a beautiful life ordained for Adam and Eve. 
But because they put attention on the flesh, they missed the beautiful life. God has a beautiful life ordained for the body of Christ. Let's not miss it. Let's not choose the wrong tree. But let's go with the straight and narrow, not the wide and the spacious. Amen? Okay. That's the church and truth. We're responsible for getting the truth out to the world by demonstration. Let's do it. Father, I thank you that you bless us indeed. You enlarge our territory. Your hand's with us to keep us from evil so that we do not cause pain. And I thank you for blessing us and keeping us and for making your face to shine upon us and being gracious unto us. You lift up your countenance upon us and you give us peace. So, Lord, we gladly invite you to rise up, let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. Amen. Amen. Amen.